seven, eight and a half chain on me. Point four, six, four. men are bringing the biggest cities of New South Wales closer together. The objective is better transport. The power is electric. Electricity is a readily available and economic source of energy. Small cables bring almost unlimited energy right to the workplace. No fuel, no pollution, no mess, just power. Electricity is the lifeblood of this modern world. In industry, commerce and the home. Railways too need electricity. 68 D then 127. Okay then. Come. 68 D. Head on 127. In New South Wales, the electric railway network is being significantly extended to Newcastle and to Wollongong, bringing quieter, faster, and more frequent passenger services to more people. Another major benefit of this expansion is that freight can also be moved under electric power. Modern electric locomotives can haul bigger loads faster, so they can be scheduled during daylight hours without slowing other traffic. But also important is that electricity is generated within, independent of the world situation of oil crises or shipping delays. Electrification starts here, in a planning office. Every inch of track in the state has been meticulously charted, and the first step is to determine which lines carry the most traffic and are more suitable for electrification. In this case here, we're proposing we combine the, uh, the signal guns and the whole instruction. Well, we have done that before, but of course we haven't done it on constant tension wiring, having a fixed wiring. More than half the cost of electrification comes in civil works, lowering the track bed, raising bridges to provide safe clearances, or in some cases, building new bridges. Tunnels present a similar problem. Either the floor must be lowered or the roof raised. Either way, it's an expensive and time-consuming task, and if neither is practicable, an extra tunnel must be built. In some cases, the upgrading work allows an opportunity for the Department of Main Roads or the Council to realign adjacent roads over new bridges. Then the old bridge is demolished. reasons this work can only be carried out when the line is closed generally at weekends this means heavy overtime charges but avoids argument between trains and construction plant to make the most of the line closure another team is engaged in the erection of the steel masts to carry the overhead wires on average, 200 pairs of masts are needed every kilometre, 200 on each side of the track. That's about 200 tonnes of steel used every kilometre. There are two types of mast used, depending on the conditions. This is the base for a portal frame, where a steel girder spans the track. These are used on tight curves or other locations, where extra strength is required. The frames are hinged at each base joint so that the vertical legs can rotate slightly, but not slide on curves. The wire loads the frame horizontally. Riggers 
are not the sort of people you immediately associate with railways. But when you think about it, they play an important role. There are more than 40 riggers involved in this electrification project. In this cutting, the supports are mounted directly onto the rock wall, but normally there'd be two steel masts supporting the girders. In straight sections of track where there would be little sideways force, single masts are simply concreted into the ground. A much simpler task, but one which still requires the same care and attention. These single masts are set at a slight angle so that the weight of the cable and its associated equipment pull the mast to its vertical position. After the mast is set, surveyors check its exact position. That's pretty close there. Okay. Fittings on the masts are computer designed so that the wire ends in the correct position. 75. That's minus 25. All right. Okay. Surveyors play an obviously important role in the project, not only in checking the route of the line, but also accurately determining the position of every mast, signal and other structure. The track itself must also be upgraded to cope with the greatly increased traffic. This amazing machine, the ballast cleaner, removes, sorts, cleans and returns the ballast to the track without disturbing the sleepers. A fleet of track upgrading equipment works in tandem to bring the track and its bed back to top condition. While the ballast cleaner sorts and removes undersized stones, rubbish and mud, ballast wagons and a flower van follow to replace what's been removed. Then comes a tamper liner which lifts the track realigns it and refixes it securely to the sleepers, all automatically. These men are taking measurements to feed into the tamper liner's computer so that the curve can be accurately reformed to its original specifications. Once all the information is entered, a laser beam is used to guide the machine to within a few millimeters in its placement of the track. Only when all this preliminary work is finished does the actual wiring crew arrive on the scene. The State Rail Authority maintains six wiring trains, all specifically designed for such work. And behind the field crews, there's an impressive support structure solving day-to-day -day problems as they arise. We've got a problem here in that we want to locate a signal at this point here in relation to the toe of the points, but your anchor wire uh, pulls off and may well go right through the signal. The problem here is the crossover, we always go straight to anchor from the crossover the shortest distance possible. I suppose the only way we can get over this problem is if we bring this wire back into running and take it to the next structure, which would involve 
an extra run of wire plus another cantilever. But we could just move this, this anchor up to there. That'll be no problem for us. The wire rolls off reels at the lead of the train and drapes along the roof from which it's hoisted by the men and hung from fittings on the stanchion. Contrary to appearance, the contact wire is not continuous from one end of the track to the other. It's hung in approximately one kilometre length, anchored securely at each end, with the tension held constant by a system of weights and pulleys. The special wiring trains are totally self-contained. The flat roofs of the cars are joined with a flexible walkway to provide a continuous work platform while inside the cars there's a complete range of tools and equipment, lunch rooms, accommodation and offices. It might be home down below for the workers, but on the flat roof of the wiring train it's work as usual. In the 220 kilometres of track electrified between Gosford and Newcastle, approximately 1,400 tonnes of copper wire were lifted and fixed. The bottom of that one. 12.78. 12.78? The team works at the head of the new length of wire, while at the same time that odd vehicle you saw earlier demonstrates its capabilities. This scissor lift, similar to those used at airports, has been specifically designed for use on the railways. It's the perfect mobile workstation for those hard to get at places. But nothing replaces good old muscle when it comes to applying initial tension to the cable. Weights to maintain the tension are added later. Every 8 to 10 kilometres along the track, an electric substation is needed. Electricity is delivered to each substation by high voltage transmission lines. 66,000 volts come into the substation. This is converted into 1,500 volts direct current and fed to the track. But even amidst this latest technology, the old system of joining cables takes a lot of beating. Okay, turn that wire over, green side up. That's in. Inside the substation, automatic sensing equipment swiftly disconnect circuits if there's a malfunction. There are backup systems so that the power can be made available following an equipment failure. The substations are linked to a central control room where a computer provides information to an operator who can remotely control equipment as required. Yeah, according to us, the number one rectifier is stripped at Lewisham, uh, Ron. Could you do something about that? Through the computer, the supervisor can check any section of the network, isolating trouble spots and directing field crews. The signal system is an important item which needs to be upgraded. 
the old semaphore signals make way for colour light signals. Again, there's a centralised control room where signals and points are controlled over a large area. To the uninitiated, it's a wiring nightmare, but these technicians painstakingly check every circuit as they go. 260, 262, main 2, USR, 86, one wire. 256C, etc., USR. 256C, etc., USR. D6. 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 And this is the heart of the system. From here, the operators, each responsible for a section of the track, keep the traffic flowing quickly and safely. Communications is the cornerstone of this operation. And before starting a journey or leaving the main line, the crew must report in. 809, coming in for a wash. Okay. Once the train is logged in, its position is automatically shown on a giant illuminated board, with its progress monitored as it passes electronic sensors. So the next time you step through the doors in an electric train for a fast, efficient ride to your destination, remember the meticulous planning, the many months of track work, often under difficult conditions, and the dedication and determination to bring to the people of New South Wales the best rail service possible. With the extension of the electric network, a new breed of double-decker trains has been designed. These interurbans are air-conditioned have aircraft-style seats and, of course, toilets for those longer journeys. The result is that people travelling between Sydney and Newcastle and soon Wollongong also have access to fast, modern, frequent and economical transport as the State Rail Authority pursues its charter to go electric.